All right, well, thank you very much for coming out today. My name is John Kenyon. I'm the executive director of the Iowa City UNESCO City of Literature Organization. And I would like to welcome you to the 2021 Iowa City Book Festival. Uh, we're very glad to be able to do uh, some in-person events during this year's festival after two years of being away. So thank you very much for joining us. Um, I would like to say to those folks who are watching on Zoom that if you have questions you would like to submit to us, please use the Q&A function on the Zoom. And when we get to that portion of the program later on in our hour, uh, we'll be monitoring that and kind of blending those in with questions from folks here in the room. So before we begin today, I wanted to thank our sponsors for the festival, who, uh, without whom we could not do this. Uh, it's supported by the City of Iowa City, the University of Iowa, and Iowa Public Radio. We also would like to thank our partners with the Iowa City Public Library, where we are today and who have been wonderful hosts for the festival for many years. We'd also like to thank Prairie Lights. Uh, they are here on site selling books. So uh, please help them and uh, pick up Greg's book when we're done here, if you haven't done so already. So now I'm pleased to introduce Gregory Galloway, who is the author of the new novel, Just Thieves. Greg was born in Burlington and grew up in Keokuk. He spent almost a decade at the University of Iowa, where he received his bachelor's and master's degrees. Wasn't supposed to be a laugh line. He's, he's, he's I accomplished a lot. Gregory Galloway, noted scholar, <laughs> bachelor's and master's degrees, as well as an MFA from the Iowa Writers Workshop. He now lives in Connecticut, and Greg is the author of two previous novels, the Alex Award winning As Simple as Snow and The 39 Deaths of Adam Strand. And today we will be discussing his new novel, Just Thieves, which was just published uh, this week, I believe, by yeah. Melville House. So um, I did want to say uh, I thought it was a wonderful book, but carrying a little bit more weight as a novelist and screenwriter, Richard Price, who said that Just Thieves is a sucker punch noir that is also a haunting and powerful allegory of work, debt, and power. So please help me welcome Gregory Galloway to the book festival. <laughs> So hello, thank sir. How are you? Thank, thanks, thanks everyone for coming. <laughs> yeah. uh, I wanted to thank John. Uh, John knows more about this genre than I do, so he can educate me a little bit. Um, I wanted to, to thank uh, Prairie Lights. Um, been going to Prairie Lights since it opened, I think, 1978. So you know, when I was a teenager, started going to Prairie Lights, and uh, you know, sort of been an institution for our family and. I uh, thought I would just mention that I love Prairie Lights, but it tried to kill me when I was an undergraduate. Um, do you know the story? I do not. Go on. I will. <laughs> so the, they used to be over on Lynn Street, and uh, I think in the early 80s, they moved to the new location. So when it was under construction, and I don't know if it was near the end of the construction, or maybe it was just Iowa City, you could still walk on the sidewalk where, while they were building prairie lights. So I'm walking past there and a hammer came and landed right in front of me. So I looked up and I saw a figure sort of move back from the building and I yelled up and finally he looked over the top of prairie lights and I said, you know, why didn't you warn me? And he said, I was afraid you'd look up. And so I thought, well, that sort of made sense. Like, do you want do you want to see do you want to see your doom, or do you want to have it hit you in the back of the head? Um, so, that's an absolutely true story, and it's also a scene in Maltese Falcon. And if you remember that book, uh, Sam Spade is talking about a case about this guy named Flitcraft who has disappeared, and Spade has to go find him. And Flitcraft has disappeared because he's walking down the sidewalk and maybe he's going by the old prairie lights and a construction beam falls in front of him. And uh, Hammett, he talks about the world as this machine and that if only we could pry the lid off of the machine and see the internal workings, we would be better off. And Spade says that Flitcraft is the only person he knows who's been able to glimpse the internal workings of the machine. Now, what happens to Flickcraft, I won't tell you, but you should go back and revisit the novel. Flickcraft does have this glimpse or changes his life. For me, the hammer did nothing. I probably went to Mickey's and that was the end of it. <laughs> I was going to say, can you see inside the machine? But no. Not. Hmm. No. Okay. I was going to say that almost sounds like a scene from one of your books. So I don't know, maybe, but since that's already been taken by Hammett. 
yeah. who did it pretty well. Maybe we just leave yeah. that. Well, it does, you know, the Just Thieves does have a few mentions, in fact, it directly mentions the getting a glimpse of the machine. That's true. That's true. And we'll talk about that shortly. I wanted to start out and talk about, you, you've talked about the genesis of the story being a scene where Rick and Frank are sitting in the car uh, talking about what they would take if their house was on fire. I was wondering if maybe you could talk about how that scene came to you, how that evolved into what this story is, and maybe talk a little bit about the story for folks who haven't had a chance to, to take a look at the book yet. We will not talk about the story, but we'll talk about that <laughs> okay. scene. Okay. That scene. Uh, so oftentimes uh, I get into characters through them talking. Um, and this happened to be two characters in a car who were talking about sort of things of value and things that don't have value and things that have uh, the most value often have the least monetary value. And uh, I wrote a few paragraphs about that and then just started to think about, well, who would be having this conversation? Why would they be having this conversation? And then realized that they were two guys who were going to go rob this house. And then that developed into thinking about who are these who are these men? Why are they robbing? And that led to uh, the fact that they work for someone else, that they don't steal for their own personal enrichment, but are hired thieves. And, you know, that ended up being sort of the genesis of the book and just started to write, write sort of the scenes leading up to them being in this car. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, when you were pursuing that then and, and realizing that you had something more was the idea to handle that in kind of a noirish fashion was that there from the get-go or was that something that evolved as you realized that was the direction the story was going i think the minute i realized that they worked for this other person then it, i realized it was it was going to be noir mm -hmm. and that would allow me to sort of explore that world and then went back and you know looked looked at a number of noir things that i really loved like you know Friends of Eddie Coyle and a lot of those novels went back to Hammett, went back to Chandler, Dorothy Hughes, Patricia Highsmith, and sort of looking at them and sort of figured out ways that I could use some of that and then sub subvert some of that. And as you know, a lot of noir, you know, for whatever reason has, has robberies in it, heists in it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I thought it would be interesting to have sort of the heist motif, which is guys who really plot and plan these robberies for very little gain. Mm -hmm. You know, mo most, most heist movies, they're after huge wealth, huge treasure, and these guys are sort of stealing trinkets by comparison. Right, right. Now, it was, it was interesting. You were talking about how you knew it was going to go in a noirous direction when you realized that these guys worked for someone. And it seems to me, you know, one of the, the tenets of noir are people who feel that they have control of their lives, but we realize that they, they don't, that they're, they are taking steps that they think might get them to point X, but there are larger factors at play. Um, and so you obviously have that going on here, not to give anything away, but was that um, then something that you wanted to kind of overlay on that story? I mean, you realize, okay, this is where I'm going and, and uh, this is what I wanna do with yeah. this. For me, it's like, you know, almost all of noir, at least all the noir I like, it is it is plays with that concept of free will versus fate. And so, you know, as I said, the minute I sort of knew who these characters were, I felt like they were up against fate, which is directly addressed through some of Frank, who's one of the partners of, of this robbery duo, sort of his attitude, which is, you know, very much to control everything and then sort of subvert that with, you know, do they have free choice? And a lot of noir, it's like every choice that someone makes leads them to some inevitable conclusion. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's this great line from George Simenon and maybe The Widow, if I'm right, um, where he says, you know, he, he, waited, he waited for the thing to happen that was determined long ago, which is pretty much noir yeah, at its yeah. core. Yeah, you can put that on a t-shirt. Yeah. Just pretty much yeah, encapsulates there's also, the entire if, genre there. If I, if I can, like, mangle a Karl Marx quote, I think he has, um, you know, we make our own histories, but our circumstances are predetermined, which is also very noir. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's sort of like, you know, the, like, you know, to put it bluntly, it's like the characters are, are sort of mice in a maze. And what they do in the maze is their own, but the maze has already been built. 
So you've got it pretty well figured out, it sounds like. Well, I, <laughs> I didn't at, at first. It took me a while. <laughs> yeah. So one thing you and I were talking about yesterday about this is the notion that noir and crime fiction is a, a genre, is an area in literature where people seem to be able to deal with real world problems and challenges that people face that a lot of times, you know, literary fiction is more about things that your average person is not going to encounter, but in crime fiction and noir fiction and in your book, they do. I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about that, about the ability to maybe comment on some of those larger tectonic plates in society that are moving around through these smaller stories in, in a way that maybe you can't with other types of fiction. Yeah, I, you know, I think it's one of the reasons that I'm drawn to this this genre is that it sort of gets to like the, you know, the basic questions of life pretty quickly. And, you know, a lot of it is the, the genre is known for violence and crime and all of that, but it is sort of deals with sort of very weighty issues. And I think it's no sort of accident that it came out of the Great Depression. People like James Kane and Dashiell Hammett, when a lot of people were sort of questioning whether capitalism was the right thing right way to go, whether it was going to be stable, whether America itself was going to be stable, all of these things were sort of in play, sort of like they are now. And noir sort of really dealt with them directly and in very interesting ways that it still does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one thing it seems like in the last 10, 15, even 20 years, there are a lot of writers who have been considered literary fiction practitioners who have moved in the direction of genre, that something that was not as accepted is is much more accepted now do you feel yourself in that continuum anywhere no no not, <laughs> not at all but, but someone that we like and admire chris offit who has a new book out that mm -hmm. has sort of been been labeled more noir fiction or crime fiction mm -hmm. he's certainly someone who i think does a great job and you know i don't really consider myself to be a literary figure at all so i just stumble around to whatever interests me and whether that's you know, mysteries or YA or crime fiction. Sure. So digging a little deeper, when you were here at the workshop, what was the perception of genre writing? Yeah, so I should qualify that and say that I was on the poetry side. Yeah. I was not on the fiction side, but on the outside peering in, it was my understanding that uh, the workshop didn't really like genre fiction. Um, and I was fortunate enough to take a class from James Collins and it was detective novel, detect, detective film. Uh -huh. And sort of, I think one of his goals was to elevate the status of it. And, you know, he introduced me to a lot of the stuff that that really influenced me over time from, you know, Elaine Robe Gray's The Erasers to Touch of Evil to Red Harvest to mm -hmm. a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I remember having a lot of conversations with him and he, he loved the genre and just thought it should be, should be thought of as, you know, some the same sort of literary status that other people have and in fact you know obviously graham green wrote crime fiction a mm -hmm. lot of established people did mm -hmm. in terms of genre and and how things are characterized you know your first book as simple as snow was originally kind of pitched as a mystery yeah but then was embraced by you know the ya community mm -hmm. and so then suddenly it, it becomes this even though it's the same prose the same text um you know, what are your thoughts about that? Because once you put a book together, regardless of what your intentions were, once it gets into the marketplace, once it gets into the hands of readers, it becomes whatever they perceive. Do you have any thoughts about that? I mean, this one seems like from the get-go, it was noir. It's been yeah. received as a noir. Yeah. It's like it's a much more traditional path. Yeah, and I think uh, to date, only a couple people have knocked it for being like literary crime fiction. So that's sort of good or bad, depending. But it's like, the, you know, that's sort of, you know, sort of where the fun is, is like how it sort of is, is received and, and how people take it. And yeah, the, the first book was published on the adult list, but it quickly became a YA novel. Mm -hmm. And most people think of it as a YA novel now. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, mostly because it had high school protagonists. Right. And in fact, uh, I think one of the, maybe PW, one of their first things, they did sort of talk about this as YA, which I think 
maybe technically because he's like 18 sort of when he goes to ask for advice and when he sort of starts his criminal stuff and they're in their 20s so it's sort of you know is a stretch at this mm. point because also i think their problems are strictly sort of more adult problems mm -hmm. yeah so i suppose if somebody buys it because they want a ya novel who are you to stop them right? exactly <laughs> <laughs> they, they they're they are technically young adults i suppose they're not teenagers yeah yeah you know, as long as somebody's picking yeah. up the book and reading it, it's a win, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, so one thing I wanted to talk about with um, this book and with As Simple as Snow in particular is kind of the notion of the, the playfulness and kind of the, the gamesmanship almost. You, in As Simple as Snow, you know, there, was, there were codes, there were a lot of clues left. I mean, it, in, from the standpoint of a mystery, but also really engaging the reader and pulling them. Here, as you alluded to earlier, you know, there are specific references to classic noir novels and, and noir films. Is that something that you do to engage yourself, to engage the readers, a little bit of both? Because there, there's that extra level to what you're doing that's not there in the work everyone puts out there. Yeah, it's, a, it's mostly for myself and then obviously hope that there are readers out there who gravitate towards, towards that stuff. Um, and, you know, it sort of came about in this where I realized I was sort of coming pretty close to appropriating other work. And then, you know, do I pull back from that or do I go full force into it? And I figured I would just go full force into it. And then that sort of opened the door of, you know, all of these other novels, films that I loved mm -hmm. and sort of, I did think that a book about thieves should do a little larceny of its own. So then started stealing from things. And then uh, one of the, sort of one of the explicit themes of the book is um, one of the characters say that people look all the time, but they don't see. And so then I thought I could do things on the page that if you just sort of read it casually, you would have an experience, but there's also sort of this under text that if you're an astute reader that you'll notice. And so a lot of the a lot of the theft that I did is acknowledged in the book, but I left, you know, at least three sort of Easter eggs planted in the book that I don't call out for people to find. Interesting. Well, and I had read an early version of this, but I do think that at the end, the, the list is there. You know, he has at the end of the book, kind of the acknowledgement is acknowledging these different liftings, uh, bits of thievery, as you talk about. Um, but I didn't notice them as I was reading through the book, and it was not until the end that I went back. But then once I went back, oh, yeah, this is obvious, but it fits very well in the flow. I mean, these are not anachronistic things that your characters would not say. So I yeah, and everything's just... from, you know, Charles Dickens to Herman Melville to more re mean streets, right. you know, so it's sort of that was sort of the trick to figure out how I could get some of these, you know, some of them are paragraphs, some of them are just sentences, but how to, how to sort of fit them in seamlessly into mm -hmm. the book. Yeah. So, but it, yeah, it definitely fits the tone. So you succeeded at least for this reader. So well done. Thank you. Um, Thank you, John. <laughs> I know you were waiting for that affirmation. <laughs> so we can just get that off the table now. Um, one thing too, with kind of the notion of thievery is I had read in another interview and I subsequently read these short stories, or at least some of them, I think in the collection that you have on Amazon, um, that you went back and kind of pilfered some scenes or settings and things mm -hmm. from other short stories that you had done. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So that came about where, you know, I got stuck in the writing of the book and couldn't figure out, it was actually with the narrator and it was about how does he enter this world? And I had written this short story about a young guy who uh, goes and asks his father's friend for a favor and, and remembered that Chandler had done that for a lot of his novels that he would go back and sort of cannibalize his short stories. And I was like, well, let me go back and look at, look at that and see if I can do it. And it sort of, that was sort of one of the keys that sort of unlocked that character and allowed me to sort of create treat him more fully and I was happy to like repurpose something of my own so you know you pick my own pocket for a change yeah so you were looking for a puzzle piece and you could go to yeah. a different box and find yep. something that fit that let you keep going yeah. so that's interesting um you know one thing there there's been considerable time in between your novels was this a, a long gestation period was this something that 
just popped up and this became the new project. Like you're always working on things, but something has to kind of bubble to the top before it gets to the point where you're really pursuing it to this level. Yeah. So as uh, which may come as a shock to people, publishing is a business <laughs> and um, I guess I'm not very good at the business. So I have some some novels that we couldn't sell, but this took this took like four years, uh, I think, to pull together, which is a long time for me. And uh, part of that is just sort of slowly figuring it out. Um, and then, you know, there was something which mo some people may have heard about the pandemic that happened. So then that sort of delayed the book by, you know, 18 months in terms of uh, coming out to the public. So it's like, you know, I sort of finished writing this a while ago and have moved on to the next thing. So I sort of have to like go back and remind myself what the hell I wrote in Just Thieves. <laughs> but, but yeah, it, it took much longer than certainly anticipated. Mm -hmm. So this has very much been met as in the marketplace by the people blurbing the book and reviewers as a, a really classic noir. And when classic noir stories are told well, it seems like they translate very well to the big screen. I think you can see where I'm going with this. Are there any that I stay out of? So, okay. um, you know, I do have representation out there on the west coast out of there. what yeah, yeah somewhere out there and you know i know that they've sent it out i don't know if there's been response to it yet but i should also mention that john mentioned he got an early copy of this and he was instrumental in sort of saying you know i think james salas i think scott phillips would respond to it and so uh the publisher sent them copies and they blurbed it so thank you for your help in that as well and uh, you know that has helped a lot. I think in the in terms of reception from people like Richard Price's endorsement and sort of put their imprimatur on it, which mm -hmm. is very helpful. Well, I'm just glad to help. And I mean, it does feel like it is kind of part of you know. There's kind of mainstream mystery fiction. There's mainstream crime fiction. And then there are folks like Salas and Scott Phillips and even Chris Offit who are doing things that. They're not necessarily tangential to crime fiction, but they're dealing with things in a different way. I mean, do you feel like part of a tradition there or something that's springing up that's maybe not what people would have traditionally thought of as crime fiction? Any way I can be attached to those people, <laughs> associate with those people, that's great. But yeah, it's like, you know, I wanted it to be, I wanted it to be a lot, you know, as a writer, you sort of want to be everything you can can possibly <laughs> attach to yourself but I did want the book to be sort of slippery along those lines and you know just try to try to push the genre forward in ways that maybe people hadn't seen before mm -hmm. and it, obviously you are widely read and, and watch a lot of crime fiction or unless you were just sitting there with a remote looking for lines to steal from these classic <laughs> films I assume you spent a lot of time with them um, so that's obviously a genre that you have a lot of affection for. There's not necessarily a question there. But yeah, yeah no. From, talk about that a little. From bit. the get go, you know, I think, I think, you know, I probably cut my teeth on like Encyclopedia Brown and Harriet the Spy, and then moved into Agatha Christie, and then pretty quickly like found found my people. You know, like got into Hammett and Chandler at a pretty young age, and you know, always loved those people and have continued to read them. And, you know, absolutely, I'm a huge fan of that genre. And then, you know, as I said, the detective novel, detective film class that I took here at Iowa mm -hmm. was just a huge influence on me. Yeah, well, good. Well, there's been a little bit of mystery, obviously, about what the story is, since you kind of not wanted to talk specifically about that. But I wondered if you could maybe share a little bit from the book. Yeah, so I thought, us. since we talked about it, I thought I would read, you know, those first paragraphs that I wrote. So, um, you know, just to briefly set it up, the, our two thieves are sitting outside this house. They have been sent by their boss to a town they're not familiar with. And uh, one of the thieves, Frank, he is he's sort of the control freak of the, the duo. And their plans when they get to town immediately go awry because he encounters a dead horse in the street, which he thinks is a sign that they should not proceed with this job. So there's a, a little bit of discussion about what they're going to do. And that said, they're on a timeline, which they're used a deadline, which they're usually not on. So they lose a day in their planning for this heist. And so um, that's sort of where we are and where we pick up in my sunglasses instead of my other glasses. Excuse me. 
everybody's slightly out of practice because of the pandemic. So well, it helps we'll when we have two there. identical oh. <laughs> There was no one on the street, no neighbors looking out the windows. I got out of the car and walked directly to the back of the house, directly to the window I had noticed the day before. I saw the small camera on the back stoop above the door. It was old, probably hadn't been used in years. There was a, the decal of a home security company in the window of the back door, a blue shield with white initials. They let it all lapse once they got comfortable. It was probably a safe neighborhood. I pried the screen out of the window jam, and sure enough, the window was unlocked, just the way I'd found it the day before, and I slid it open and crawled through into the kitchen. I moved straight through the kitchen, walking through the dining room, and took a look in the living room. There was nothing there. I looked anyway. I walked down the hallway, and there was a small office. There was a desk, a small couch against one wall, and some bookcases. The shelves of the bookcases that have a few family photographs and some other crap. I scanned the shelves and there was what we'd been sent for sitting right there in front of me. I knew it was going to be easy. It was a small statue of a goat, a cheap silver animal trophy that had Roman numerals engraved on it and a bunch of initials, an abbreviation for something. I didn't really pay that much attention to it. To be honest, I didn't really care. It's what we came for, so I took it and put it in my shoulder bag and walked back through the house and crawled back out the window. I replaced the screen and walked down the sidewalk and around the corner where Frank was waiting. I handed him the bag so he could look for himself. Nothing worth, nothing worth much here, I said, nothing valuable anyway. It's the things that don't have any value that are worth the most, Frank said, like he was a sage sitting on top of some mountain. It's something I read in a fortune cookie, he said, but it was something he'd told me before. It was something he believed. You worried about it, I said. Not yet, Frank said, but I'm working on it. We started back to the hotel and Frank began brooding. We wouldn't be able to get back fast enough. We almost didn't get back at all. Stuff that has value can be replaced, Frank had said. A house, car, money, almost anything you can buy, you can buy again. But sentimental stuff, family stuff, ex-girlfriend stuff, your kid's first drawing, whatever means something that no one would care about but you, that's the stuff that works that's worth the most. Think about it. If you could only take one thing in the world with you, what would it be? Frank was not sentimental about those types of things, material objects. Over the years, I had become less sentimental, I suppose. But I think I know what Frank would want to save. If he could take one thing, it would be a book. Plato's Republic, maybe, but that's not right. He could replace a book. No, he would take something that wasn't his. But he already knew my answer. It was a money clip I kept in my pocket. My father had given it to me. His father had given it to him. It had initials engraved on it. It was scratched and bent and wasn't worth any more than the stainless steel that went into making it, but it was the most important thing I owned. My father gave it to me the day I cashed my first paycheck, and I had never gone a day without it being in my pocket. What would you do if someone took that from you, Frank said. I would do whatever it took to get it back. But this isn't that, do you think? Frank opened the shoulder bag and looked at the small silver goat statue and put it in the seat between us. Well, it's worth enough for someone wanting it stolen, and that means someone knows more about it than we do. Frank never liked to not know. This isn't good, he said. This is trouble. We'll give it to Fromer, that's their boss, and then it will be his trouble. I put the statue back in the bag and put it in the back seat. This isn't any trouble, not for us, I said. Frank nodded but wasn't convinced. And then the trouble came that proved us wrong. Thank you. So one last question for me, and then I think we'll open it up to the audience. Um, your first couple of books feel like they're set where you grew up. This one is kind of a faceless place. Obviously, you have details and such, but you can't look at it and say this is Chicago, Baltimore, Minneapolis, whatever. Was, was that a conscious decision as well? Yeah, that was. That was. And in fact, um, I got a little pushback about not naming the city. And uh, luckily, the editor was on my side, and he thought that it should sort of take place in an undisclosed location. And my argument was that I wanted to sort of take place in this noir universe. And, um, you know, I've 
sort of enjoyed thinking about that. I think about actual places where it could occur, but I chose not to pin it down at all. So what, what was the pushback? What was the, the reason behind that? Mostly that, the, you know, it sort of doesn't allow readers a way into that universe if you don't name it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I pointed out that there's lots of noir stuff that is unnamed. Mm -hmm. uh, in some ways, it's a trope of the genre as well. Yeah, interesting. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing from that. So I'm going to move over here where I will grab the microphone. Uh, for folks in the room, if you have questions, just please uh, give me a sign so I can come around and uh, get the microphone to you. Because we are on the Zoom, I will ask that you wait for me to come with the microphone so those who are watching will be able to hear. And I'll also be monitoring the chat on Zoom. So for those who are watching, please use the Q&A uh, function of the Zoom so that you can submit questions and we'll take a look at those. So. Allow me a moment. All right. All right. It looks like the folks on Zoom are still formulating their questions. So do we have any questions from here in the audience? Right. Make my way to you. I'll come to you. Okay. Uh, Gregory, I'm wondering. <laughs> If you had to uh, research for just get the setting and, and sorts of things like that uh, from from places outside of the noir literature, you mentioned reading a lot of fiction. I wondered if you had to do research beyond that in, in you know nonfiction. I did. So I I did some research. One of the characters in there, he's sort of very adept at. Um, sort of confusing home security systems. So I did a little research on how that's done and how to sort of disrupt Wi-Fi and those types of things, which it turns out is pretty easy and, you know, easily available information, unfortunately. But I sort of did, I did some research on, you know, how, how sort of robberies are conducted. <laughs> Just without actually robbing anything, I should point that out. Say just reading research. Yeah. Okay, you got a question over there. Yeah, sure. Thanks, John. Hey, Greg. Um, I had a question. Uh, you mentioned several novels that you couldn't uh, get in people interested in, as you you said in terms of the delays between the your the previous novel and this one. And and I, and I my question comes from the perspective of, as a scientist. There's been a di really quite di a disruption in scientific publishing uh, with a thing called bioarchive. And what we do now is we post papers and then we tweet some figure from them and then people go and read them. And then, you know, we still try to publish them in journals, but the, the real communication actually happens completely freely. Um, and so I wondered, wh what do you do with those, those novels that you couldn't find a publisher interested in uh, rather than having, them? I'm sure they're, 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 some of them are bothering you. I know one of my papers took 12 years to write, but it finally <laughs> got out, which is ridiculous because it's like eight pages long. Um, and I just wonder what, what happens to the ones that we don't see, essentially. Maybe they'll go unseen. I don't know. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll sort of figure it out. And, you know, I think ultimately it's like, being published is like a happy byproduct of what I do. And I don't know if you feel about that way with, with scientific papers, that, that it's a happy byproduct of your research or not. But it's like, you know, I've been writing since I could write, probably. It's like, you know, my mom says that I announced I wanted to be a writer before I could actually write or knew how to write. Um, so I've always written. So most of my life I've been unpublished. So, you know, <laughs> that's sort of like, that's what I'm comfortable with. <laughs> so, so I, I don't, you know, it, it's, it, I'm glad that I am published obviously and, and love, you know, sharing my work and all that stuff, but I'm not one of those people that feels compelled to. So, you know, I could obviously self publish, which I did a collection of short stories and tried that experiment and I could, you know, do lots of other things, you know, people have done them via Twitter you know, where they release work, you know, chunk at a time. And, you know, I sort of just move on to the next thing and someday maybe we'll circle back and, I do have a novel about conjoined twins that I quite love, but nobody else seems to like it, but <laughs> we'll see where that goes. <laughs> and actually, you know, I, I should say, 
you know, years ago, you and I talked and I was working on something where you were quite helpful about, um, you know, epilepsy. And, and that's a novel that's sitting around and we'll see what happens ultimately with that too. All right, I've got a question over here. Thank you, John. I was, uh, if you feel comfortable, I was interested in the environment and the process that you use to write. By that, I mean, you get up every morning and go to some office and there's post-it notes all over and you've got some laptop or, uh, how's it work? That's a good question. I wish I knew the answer. Um, it's it's like a little, it's sort of where my poetry side is probably a hindrance a little bit. I have no, I I'm undisciplined is the nice way of saying that and would not recommend my approach to anything, but um, I've gotten more disciplined over the years. I mean, it is something I do. I do write every day. But when that happens, where that happens, how that happens is changes all the time. Um, I'm a person who, uh, one of the characters, Frank in here is superstitious. And I think I'm a little superstitious about where I write and there are spots that sort of work. So like a chair will work for four or five days and then that's not working. So I have to move to a different part of the house. Um, I write on a laptop, I write longhand, I scratch notes then, pieces of paper I carry on my pocket, um, sort of all over the place and ultimately sort of get there. And if you read this, the novel is sort of told in a somewhat scattershot fashion, which is probably more a reflection of how I write. I have no idea of plot or anything. So um, I don't keep, I don't keep like an outline or notes or anything. And for me, it's like, I have to keep it all in my head. So this I carried around in my head for, you know, three, four years. And I think that helps me. I just go over stuff and over stuff and over stuff. And, you know, I think that, you know, doing that helps me because I've gone through a number of drafts before I physically write. So, I, you know, luckily I don't have to do a whole lot of rewriting when it gets done, but I do a lot of obsessive thinking in my head. It's a mess up there. <laughs> All right, I'll save you here. We've got a couple of questions on the Zoom and then we'll come back to folks in the room who have questions. Um, so we have a question, why do we love noir fiction? So I'll get you the easy one here to start off with. Uh, it's got everything. It's got <laughs> violence, it's got weighty questions. Uh, it's usually fast paced, my stuff not included. Uh, <laughs> And, you know, I think for, for me, why I'm drawn to it is, is there's ambiguity in it, <clears throat> which I love. And the people who know as simple as snow will relate to the ambiguity that I embrace. And I think that's a big component, um, you know, who's good, who's bad, and that sort of slips all over the place. And, you know, but it's, a, it's a fun, dark world to hang out in. Okay. Good. Right, John? You yes. know. I, yes, yes. It, it's, it's good to be in the darkness on the page so that then you don't have to deal with that That's in right. real life. So um, so this one, I'm guessing there's probably a, an interesting answer here. It says, have you ever stolen anything yourself that you're willing to share? <laughs> um, I robbed a bank here in town. <laughs> okay. U U.S. Bank, was that Iowa State Bank? Yeah, yeah. When it was Iowa State Bank, or I should say I attempted to rob the bank. <laughs> Go on. Uh, <clears throat> when I was a sophomore, there was someone on the hall who was a film student who wanted to make a student film. So he recruited myself and the guy across the hall to be in his student film. And he, his film was a heist movie. And so he asked us if we would pretend to rob the bank. So we had fluorescent water pistols and goofy bandanas that we wore. And I remember my friend Bruce and I both asked him, you got permission? Oh, I got permission. Oh, I got permission. So he was in the car with the camera and he wanted us to run into the bank, wait a few seconds and then run back out of the bank. So we ran into the bank and about the time we got in the lobby, the security guys grabbed us <clears throat> and, uh, they were like, what the hell are you doing? And we said, we're making a movie. And they were like, no, you're not. And we said, we have permission. And they said, who do you have permission from? And we pointed out the door and our friend with the camera drove off. 
So, you know. So you weren't a good robber. Then. Well, I guess we were a horrible <laughs> robbery duel. But I, we always wondered if that was his whole point of his stupid film anyway. Like he never meant to make a heist movie. He meant to make a movie about these two morons that he convinced <laughs> to make a heist movie. Or about a really unreliable getaway driver as well. So, yeah. All right, we've got a question from the back of the room here. So this is going to jog your memory. How old were you when you knew that you wanted to write? And was there a specific writer that inspired you to want to take that path? I don't think so. I think mom says that I said when I was like four years old that I wanted to be a writer. Actually, it's like, I think I announced I wanted to be a writer and a button collector, which I'm sure I had no idea what either one meant, but I have spent, I've spent like 50 some years figuring out if I made the wrong choice, I probably should have gotten the button collector out maybe. I still have the buttons. See? I can always go back to that. But so I don't think that I, you know, I don't think there was a specific writer, but, you know, I did grow up in a house that was filled with books. Both my parents were very widely read. We did have a, a neighbor in Burlington who I sort of think like, like she sort of made my choices for me at a very young age. I think she, she had me playing dictionary games when I was really young. She had me playing word games. She always did artistic stuff with me. And I think she wanted me to be a writer before I wanted to be a writer. All right, we've got one from over here. Okay. Is this thing on? <laughs> okay, um, so, so I'm on the spot. Is that, um, um, how, how um, how do you know that 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 that, pe that people won't like your novels? Like you said, conjoin twins or the or, or the what was it? The snow day or something? What was it? Yeah, well, that one came out. The snow, the snow came out. Um, the conjoined twins, you know, th those are people who are telling me that. So uh, you know, <laughs> I don't know that. Maybe we'll find out. I hope we'll find out. But yeah, it's a it's a good question. Actually, it's a very good question. Um, and that's sort of the thing, the frustrating part of the business side of publishing, which is they're sort of guessing what the appetites of people are going to be, you know, 16, 18 months in the future. And it's sort of like- I've never read them, who knows? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right, Greg, well, you might, you've got an audience of one ready to go. Exactly. <laughs> Those darn gatekeepers, yeah. so. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you for your amazing uh, talk about your book. Um, I'm wondering, so you mentioned the noir, genre. I'm not very familiar with the noir genre, but you do mention a lot of 20th century references, the Maltese Falcon, Graham Greene. So what made you write a noir uh, novel in the 21st century? And you mentioned Wi-Fi, <laughs> um, but how, what motivated you and why, why write a noir novel in the 21st century, I guess? What sort of urgency is there for you as a writer? Yeah, as I said, it's like, you know, I think the noir sort of came around in the depression when everything was sort of up for grabs. And I sort of feel like we're at that place now. Um, and I think all the, all those questions that they laid out then are still relevant. And, you know, we did get a review not too long ago that said if you took out the technology aspects of the book, that it would sort of be in the classic noir period. So I sort of wanted wanted both those worlds sort of call back to that period, but also sort of bring it up to date as well. Does that answer your question? Thanks. Yeah, I've got uh, a question here on the Zoom, but before we go, maybe just building on that. I mean, obviously, technology is, is a strange thing to bring into noir because we so associate noir with, you know, a, a less technological age. Is, is there a not a tendency, I guess. Uh, is there a, uh, I can't think of the word now, a um, reason to not bring technology into things? You know, I guess, are, are you thinking of ways, oh, well, maybe this is a little too whiz-bang to, to bring into it something that's noir, so I'll try to write around it, I guess is what I was getting Yeah, at. I think I, in some ways it's like just from, I think, a storytelling perspective, technology, at least for me, adds a lot of complexities. Like if you didn't have it, like I always, I always sort of think like, like uh, British, British crime films are more interesting because of the cops don't have guns. And it's like, it's a challenge. 
like sort of, you know, in American stuff, when something happens, and I sort of reference this in the book as well, when something happens, somebody just shoots somebody and then you move on. It's a very easy <laughs> plot device, right? So if you took that out of the equation, then you actually have to think about, well, how do I resolve this? Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, I think, and I try to do it, which is that, that the technology things are solved, but they're, they're not central to the story. Mm -hmm. I was thinking that the other day reading a book where a character used a cell phone and 20 years ago that would have seemed like oh look at you showing off about the technology and now it's just utilitarian yeah. and so that will change obviously over time as things just become more well you just think about like uh, the film wall street where our people remember michael douglas <laughs> is like on the he's outside with his cell phone and it's like that big you know it's like this huge walkie-talkie everybody's like oh that's so cool <laughs> Indeed. All right, we have a question from the Zoom. Uh, was there something specific about the psychology of Thebes that appealed to you in writing this book? Do you see them as sort of archetypal noir figures? I, yeah, a lot of noir deals with two principal elements, greed and corruption, um, and as a way to sort of better oneself. Um, and as noir develops, you sort of go from the corruption from the criminals to the corruption to the police to the corruption of the criminal justice system to ultimately it's the entire system is corrupt. So um, what I tried to do was have thieves that sort of didn't want, that they feel as if their greed is under control. They want a middle-class existence. Um, so they feel that they've figured out how to operate within this system and then, of course, it doesn't work out well for them, but that's also a part of noir fiction as well. Do we have any other questions? We've got one here I'll come over to. I'm just uh, curious, you mentioned like weighty questions in noir. Do you, do you go into it with those questions in mind or do they develop as you write it? Yeah, they, de they develop as I write it, but they're, they're sort of there. Um, I think in the genre itself, they're sort of there, but they're sort of lurking in the background. And then you start to think of them, I try to have everything sort of come organically from the characters themselves, but they have those conversations and they sort of, you know, are thinking about those things as well. So they sort of pop up and recede as the characters sort of develop and come about. So one question I had in where we were talking about this is law enforcement isn't a big presence in your book. It is in some crime fiction and obviously not in others. Was that a conscious decision? I mean, I know in noir, a lot of times folks are solving their own problems, which is kind of a tenet of the, the genre, but was that a conscious decision for you? It was, yeah. So, well, you know, I thought they were irrelevant in this world. And as you know, they do enter it briefly, but they're sort of tangential to the story. And that was my point, which is sort of like the world that these guys live in is just so corrupt that the police aren't going to make any difference in this world. Mm -hmm. Well, and it seems too that you know, it's something that I know particularly more straight up mystery and crime fiction is dealing with now with the way that law enforcement is perceived that the, the tactics that are dealt with in books maybe are things that would not be looked on the same way today as they might have been even two or three years ago. So yeah, and, uh, you know, avoiding that's, it. <laughs> that's something about the genre itself. And as you well know, it sort of went through a period in the 50s where it's it's really like hyper misogynistic. And you know, those those novels don't hand hold up well. And it's sort of interesting to sort of go back to the beginning that there were women writers, Dorothy Hughes being one of them, who sort of challenges all of that stuff from the get-go, you know, that her novels deal with everything from toxic masculinity to race relations in the early 40s, PTSD, you know, In a Lonely Place is written directly after the war that talks about PTSD. Mm -hmm. I think the, that no one else is really writing about at the time, certainly not in this genre, but it's like, yeah, I think I didn't think about it in those terms in the police. Like I said, it was just like, I don't think they, they fit into this world or have an impact on this world. Right. Right. You might have made a decision that benefited you in the long yeah. run by not having that be an element. Uh, do we have any other questions from folks in the room? I think we're all taken up on the Zoom, but okay. Got one over here. 
you've talked a lot about um, your writing process and the things that you write. So maybe you've said what you want to cover, but how do you make the transition from poetry to fiction? And do you have any poetry published? I do. I had some poetry published in the Iowa Review and I don't know, uh, some magazines that are no longer in existence, I'm sure. Um, for me, it's like I never, I actually applied to the fiction workshop and the poetry workshop and I got accepted in poetry. So I always say that my novels are my revenge against the <laughs> fiction program. Um, but I never really separated them. And in fact, I think I think the poetry is like a really good basis for writing what I write in, uh, you know, both in mysteries and, and even noir, because I think that that poetry, and if you look at it from Shakespeare to the romantics, all those odes, they're investigations, they're investigations of things. And in some ways, they're investigations of mysteries, they're investigations of, of things that are difficult to investigate, you know, love and death and all of those things. And so writing poetry is an investigation in those subjects. And it's also an investigation through language. And as you become combine those two, you ultimately just lead to writing itself. So it doesn't matter whether it's poetry or fiction or nonfiction. Does that answer your question? Any other questions from here in the audience? I'll use the right microphone here. Okay. Um, one question I wanted to ask, Greg, because we're here in Iowa City, you're an Iowa kid. What influence can you see on your writing, on your work, being an Iowan, and particularly your time here in Iowa City, you alluded to the fact that the, the course that you took on film had an impact, obviously, on, on your perceptions of noir and all of that. Are, are there other influences that you would point to, both maybe academically and not, that are brought um, to bear on your work? I guess that my writing is super white, like Iowa. <laughs> 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 sort of, sort of a facetious answer, but, um, you know, I, I'm a product of, of what I am, was, you know, came from a working class town in Iowa, and, you know, I think that has influenced me in terms of, you know, sort of how middle class, lower middle class people live in the world, and, you know, let's face it, where I grew up, it was, you know, what, 95% white, so, you know, those are things that even coming to Iowa, which was certainly much more diverse than where I grew up, was still, you know, pretty pale. Um, and, you know, as I've gone out in the world, I've tried to try to learn things that I have from, but, you know, the workshop at the time I was there, and luckily it's changed. It did not have a whole lot of diversity. Um, and so th those are sort of more challenges to overcome. But, you know, I think that the influence is, is really coming from, you know, a, a river town in Iowa had a lot of influence on me and sort of like I relate to a lot of, you know, factory towns, working class towns, working class environment. Michael, to join you here as we wrap up so you don't have to look halfway across the room. Um, so thanks to everyone uh, on Zoom who was watching, who submitted questions. Thanks to everyone who was here, who uh, asked some questions. We appreciate that interaction. And so I don't have to talk, though I could talk for a long time about noir fiction with Greg. But uh, thank you so much thank for you. presenting to us. Please help me thank Gregory Galloway. I've got cookies for people. <laughs> so, come, so come get some cookies. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Our apologies to those watching on Zoom. Uh, <laughs> they are not. <laughs> All right. They're, they're faux. They're faux cookies. All right. Well, Greg is passing out cookies uh, rather aggressively. I did want to say that we have the uh, the rest of the festival yet to go. We are back in this room at one o'clock with Christy Nabin Warren, who will be talking about her book, uh, Meatpacking America. At 2.30, Chewy Renteria is going to be discussing his new memoir, We Heard It When We Were Young. And then at four o'clock, we have a, a truly hybrid event where uh, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, uh, the author of the uh, Indigenous People's History of the United States, 
and the new book, uh, Not a Nation of Immigrants, will be up on screen here, and I will be interviewing her uh, from the room. So for those of you who would be interested in that uh, track of wonderful books about immigration policy in the United States, I would encourage you to stick around. Uh, we also have other things going on. The University of Iowa Library has a reading by Laura Jellett at 2.30, and all throughout the afternoon from 1 to 4, they are doing a uh, special uh, open house in the special collections room up on the third floor of the library, and that is not to be missed. So thank you very much for coming out, and uh, I will remind you that our friends at Prairie Lights are out in the hallway, and they would be happy to sell you one of Greg's books, and he will be joining them out there to sign. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you, sir.